Hello everyone. Welcome to thematic session 19. Welcome by Da, Jabba, IT, Audrey, Ina, Timili, Karen, Charlotte, Alexandra. You're all most welcome. We are going to have a very lively interaction. We have a speaker who I'm going to introduce in a few minutes. Um, and she, she will share with us what she does and what she's planning on doing. But she's also looking very, very much forward to um, hearing from you, to learning from your, what you're doing, the experiences you have from all over the world. So it's going to be, we are looking forward to learning and, and, and learning from each other, sharing our experiences. So you're very, very welcome. Please prepare. We will start at the plenary and then later break out into, go into our breakout rooms. Of course, there there's going to be much more interaction than there will be in here in the plenary. Just a minute, within a minute we'll start, but you are all welcome. Please prepare your questions. Very, very difficult questions for Niyoshi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, this is about uh, family-based care. It's about relief for um, <laughs> relief support for, for children. <laughs> it's about COVID-19. So yeah, let's put... Uh, okay. Here we are. Um, Yeah, we are going to spend the next uh, 40 minutes or so talking about family-based care and relief support during COVID-19 uh, with an organization based in India, uh, but has uh, an international outreach. It's called Miracle Foundation. Um, more about that organization you'll, you'll hear shortly. My role, uh, is to introduce the speaker, the presenter. I am privileged to. I am privileged to um, introduce Niyoshi. Niyoshi is an experienced global program director. Uh, she has worked with Miracle Foundation since 2012. As a child protection and child rights social, social impact leader, she has spear, she spearheads collaboration between Miracle Foundation's international team to successfully develop sustainable, scalable, and measurable programs based on the UNCRC, the UN Guidelines for Alternative Care of Children, and the Juvenile Justice Act. Miyoshi is knowledgeable in the field of family-based and alternative care, monitoring, evaluation, and learning creating technology solution, education and in team building programs and partnerships to bring quality services to children around the world. She holds a master degree in education from Texas State University and received her bachelor's of science degree in marketing from Indiana University. I could go on and on, uh, her CV is long, but we do not have the luxury of time. So uh, we will get to know more about her bilaterally, but for now I hand the floor back to her so that she can tell us how um, Miracle Foundation is actually actualizing Article 9 of the CPMS. Actual, actual, Article 19 of CPMS is about alternative care. And that is her strong, strong, uh, strong area of focus. So Niyoshi, most welcome. Thanks so much, Aching, for that incredible introduction. I so appreciate it. And to all of you that are here listening, 
I hope you are ready to, you know, prepare to participate and ask your questions and share your stories and experiences with me as well. Um, it's been, you know, with COVID-19, it's been um, every day has been you wake up and there's new news to process or another hardship that we have to overcome. But the silver lining that I have found over the last six months of, you know, being in lockdown and unable to travel is this opportunity to connect with all of you, which I don't know if that would have happened. So it's just truly my honor and privilege to be here to share um, what we're doing at Miracle Foundation with you. And so before we get started, I'll do a quick introduction, and then we're going to jump into some really interactive Mentimeters and breakout rooms um, and save some really great chunk of time for Q&A as well. So I am Niyoshi Mehta, and I am based in Austin, Texas. I was born in India, in Mumbai, if any of you are familiar or have traveled before. And I moved to the States with my family 20 years ago. And so now I am here in Texas, and I work with Miracle Foundation, and I'm so happy to represent the team um, here today. Uh, we have a lot of work that we do in India specifically. And so my conversation with you, you all today will focus around the work we do specifically in India. So at Miracle Foundation, you know, our mission is to take care of children, specifically orphans or children that are separated from families and are institutionalized. I don't know if many of you are aware, but a lot of children that you know, for years have been placed into orphanages, either by family or by government officials, or have somehow made their way there. 80% um, of them worldwide, in fact, have a family member that with support can take care of the children and they don't need to be in orphanages. So that's the article that Aching mentioned as well earlier, is this uh, importance of placing children in families and not um, institutionalizing them. So that's our focus. Our core initiatives are making sure children don't enter the system in the first place. So prevention, you know, how can we make community strong? How can we make families strong? And how do we make sure we develop the social workforce so that children don't end up in orphanages in the first place? And then the second initiative that we focus on primarily is to make sure children thrive. So making sure they have access to education, healthcare and protective services, uh, whether they're in their family or whether they are living in an institution. And you might hear me use these words interchangeably. When I say institution, you might call it, or you might be familiar with the word residential care, or you might be familiar with the term orphanages, but it all means the same thing. And so today, before we jump into, um, you know, what I was going to speak about specifically, I'd love to pop up a Mentimeter. So if you have your laptops handy or your um, cell phones handy, um, go to menti.com. And if we can put up the code for um, Mentimeter, that would be great. There's some quick questions that I'd like to ask this group. The link directly okay. there is in the chat. If that's easier for people, they can go directly to the question through my link. Perfect. So if you look at the chat, um, you'll see a little code. There's some quick questions. There's three um, that we just want to get a feel for where you are and um, what you think about uh, family-based care, about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on family-based care. So if you could take a minute to answer each question. All right, the answers are up on the screen there. I believe that's about the number of people that we had answer the first question, if you'd like to address it at all. Perfect, yeah. Um, I'll talk about all three of them together. So if we could shift to the third one as well, that'd be great. Fantastic, one moment. Great, so I see everyone staying kind of around the same ballpark of, you know, anywhere from 13 to 30 days. I see a 60 days, great. Well, you know, the reason I am here today is to one, tell you about the impact COVID-19 had in India. There, you might find some sim similarities there with um, what you found happen in your community, in your country as well. Um, and specifically, what I wanted to focus the conversation on today is how we responded and why it's so important now more than ever. So. One of the first questions I asked was, you know, uh, the placements that were made due to COVID-19, are they 
called reintegration. So if you're familiar with case management, um, you know, a case management process is step by step. It's uh, five to six steps. It takes a long time. And uh, there's an incredible amount of time spent working with children and working with families. What we saw with COVID-19 in March 24, on March 24th of this year, India went into lockdown and they're still in lockdown. When they went into lockdown, you know, millions of families found themselves out of a job. Um, this resulted in them unable to take care of their children and families. And at the same time, the Supreme Court of India issued an order um, re requesting all child care institutions to place children back into families. What this resulted in is was a slew of rapid placements uh, we noticed about 300 placements that were made into families just within a period of 13 and a half days. So uh, in an ideal world, the case management process would take anywhere from like three months to about 12 months, um, if not more. And what we saw with COVID-19 around the world that has kind of reduced down to 13 and a half days. And the latest, you know, if I would have given this presentation a month ago, it would have been a little bit different. I would have stopped at, okay, here's what happened with COVID. Here's how we responded. Here's our case management process. Why I'm here today and even more enthusiastic about this conversation more than ever is just on September 23rd, the National, Protect, the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights in India issued a directive giving eight states that have the majority of population uh, of children that are in institutions and they've given them a hundred day directive. So some of you who guessed that it was around 60 days, you were close, it's a hundred days. So we have the next hundred days to make sure India and everybody in India and around the world knows about effective case management processes. We have a hundred days to make sure that we are including children and families in the conversation. We have a hundred days to make sure the social workforce have the tools and resources they need to make sure the children um, are centered in the conversation and decisions are made about their placement, keeping their best interest in mind. Our case management process, if you've listened to the YouTube video um, where I was talking about the case management process, if you haven't, I encourage you to do that. If you go to the Alliance's YouTube page, um, and if you might have seen the abstract as well in the materials that were sent out earlier. Um, so I encourage you to read through the details, but just a quick highlight on what those were is, um, you know, our case management process helps social workers. So if you are a social worker or work with governments in the social workforce, I encourage you to take a look at it. What it'll help you do is it'll give you guidelines on how to conduct assessments. So how to con have conversations with children and families remotely. So it gives you tons of tips on how to do that effectively remotely. It also gives you access to our risk assessment tools. So our risk assessment tools allows you to center child protection and make it uh, one of the key indicators of whether a child should continue living in their family or in an institution. And then the third thing it really highlights is the Home Thrive Scale. Our Home Thrive Scale is a holistic assessment tool that um, focuses on the well-being of a child and a family. So it's looking at the economy, it's looking at their living conditions, it's looking at the family and child's relationship, their access to education, healthcare, and mental health services. And one of the things I do want to make sure we do is to um, provide you with access to that link that I'm going to pop up um, just right here in the chat functionality. So you might have seen me um, if you look at the chat functionality, you'll have access to our risk assessment tool and Home Thrive Scale as well that you can leverage if you uh, find yourself working with children and families and uh, the social workforce in your countries. One of the next things I want to do is just give you a couple, two minutes, and we're going to hop back on to Mentimeter. Um, if you're having trouble accessing Mentimeter, that's okay. Grab a piece of pen and paper. We're going to go into two minutes of just individual reflection. And what I'd love to hear from all of you is, you know, now that you've heard how families were impacted and how children were impacted in India, what I'd love to know is how were families and children impacted in your countries? And what type of support or help do you think they need? If you don't have experience 
um, working with children and families directly, feel free to provide your assumptions and opinions as well. Um, we really want to make sure you're participating and sharing your experience. So I encourage you to check your chat link again. And there's a link for Mentimeter. Click on that and go ahead and take two minutes for just individual reflection. Yeah, totally. We've seen similar. I'm seeing a lot of, you know, the impact on economic stability. Um, I love that someone put post-recovery services. We're finding that's kind of key and critical. It's that follow-up support that's needed. Um, same with education. Of course, we're seeing that around the world, the dis um, disruption in education and access, um, which we're seeing as well. Um, yes, and on top of COVID-19, there have been a lot of natural disasters um, that have happened as well that have um, displaced a lot of people as well. I love all of these. It's, it's great to know, um, you know, I guess the silver lining here would be to know that we're not in this alone. <laughs> um, you know, we're all experiencing a variety of different things in our countries, um, but there's some similarities here. Um, and what I'd love to do now is uh, so that you don't have to keep hearing me talk. <laughs> I want to uh, give you an opportunity to talk to each other and uh, we're going to break out into breakout rooms for the next 10 minutes. Um, what I want you to do in your breakout rooms is identify one question that you want to ask me. What we'll do is you, within your breakout rooms, I also want you to identify a spokesperson who will be responsible to come back into this plenary and then in the chat, add the question when, um, I ask, when one of us asks you to do so. And then we'll go into 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, we're, you know, we only have 40 minutes, so I wish we had more time to kind of dive deep into case management because we could go on for hours. But because we're able, um, we're short on time, we'll take 10 minutes for small breakout rooms. And then I might be popping in and out of breakout rooms. So if I see you in a breakout room, I'll see you there. If not, I'll see you back in this main room in 10 minutes. Um, I would love for you, if the groups, when you were in your breakout rooms, if you were able to assign a spokesperson, I'd love for those spokespeople to put in, in the chat function, uh, the question that you came up with that I can address for you. And while you do that, I will address um, two questions that were brought to my attention. One, because I in the breakout room that I was in, and then... Um, one that um, Aching asked me that someone had um, posed a comment earlier. So I'll kind of start with, oh, and I love John Williamson. Thank you for sharing other resources. Yes, um, Better Care Network is a great resource for anything related to alternative care, family-based care. Um, love that, you know, we're um, including the conversation around children with disabilities as well. So thank you for sharing that resource. Um, to kind of start off, uh, one of the first, um, questions I want to address, someone asked, um, is there are a lot of reintegration practices happening around the world. And one question was how Miracle Foundation is um, addressing, assessing risk in our process. And so um, one of the things that you will see in our expedited case management process is um, the first thing we are encouraging and asking all um, all government officials um, and social workers that are involved in assessing children and making these placement decisions is to assess risk. Um, you know, to prior look at the risk factors for the child, for the family, for the environment, um, and to um, categorize them in low, medium, high critical risk. Most importantly being by identifying the children and that families that fall in the critical risk that there's appropriate um, action that could be taken right away. Um, we are seeing in India as well that, you know, children, there's been a greater, there's been an increase in um, cases of child marriage. Um, that's common practice um, and we're seeing an increase. So our risk assessment tool is really designed to address some of these factors before it even becomes an issue. So I would encourage you if you scroll back up, um, on the chat link um, is if you see the link to our risk assessment tool, and I'll be happy to share it on the Guild as well after the session. So you can take a look at that risk assessment tool. 
And the way we've had to assess the risk is primarily remotely. So uh, with remote assessment, it's just required a lot of training. And that's just the reality. Um, a lot of social workers and government officials have been so used to um, you know, working with families and children in person. This is a whole new level when you're trying to connect with them on the phone. So some of the tips that we are giving is schedule a time whenever possible, make it short. So, you know, don't expect them to stay on the phone with you for 15 minutes. Sometimes it has to be as quick as five minutes, 10 minutes, um, and ask open-ended um, questions um, and just practice the basic social um, worker counseling skills. So keep um, active listening skills in mind. So instead of asking, are you eating nutritious, delicious food? Um, we're training social workers to ask, you know, tell me how are, um, what did you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, did you like it? Um, we're also asking them um, questions like, you know, to kind of assess the relationship between members of the family is, um, tell me how you're spending time with each other. Um, is this regular practice? And so asking these open-ended questions um, and making it conversational, short conversations. And the biggest thing we've had to do when we're assessing risk and addressing this remotely is to leverage the champions and heroes within the community. So remote, there's only so much you can do remotely over the phone. And so we've had to identify neighbors, we've had to identify these village child protection committees that might exist within the community, and to leverage their expertise and um, their relationship with the family to help assess the risk and to keep up and follow up with these families. There was another question that I'm seeing here is, what is your plan to trace the families and ensure they can provide a protective home environment for the children? Um, really great question. You know, there's one, um, the kind of clear response is like simple response, quick response is we leverage our home thrive scale. So our home thrive scale is designed to be not only a tool to help you identify the family strengths and some of the needs that they have, but it's also designed to address some of the long-term needs of the families. And so it requires ongoing follow-up. So our social workers and our case management process requires that you follow up with families every 10 to 15 days. Um, and that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's always perfect. You know, it's um, a learning process. And I think identifying, again, people in the community to support the um, Tracing of families for the long term is something that's key and is definitely needed. And I'll see we have four more minutes. And so I'll pick one more question. Um, the whether children, whether and how children with disabilities included in the response this is such an important question. And, um, you know, far too often they're kind, they're not even included in the discussion. And so, um, yes, our case management process is definitely designed to address the needs of all children. Um, it can especially be leveraged because of the impact of COVID-19 and the rapid placements that have taken place. But it, it can also, this was something we were using even before COVID-19. So it's um, really a tool that's designed to address the needs of all children and families. Miracle, Miracle Foundation specifically, we don't have experience working with children um, with disabilities, but we do work with governments um, who of course are involved and um, have direct access. And so um, that's kind of, that's what we do is through them, we're able to address uh, the needs of children with disabilities, but in terms of direct experience, um, Miracle Foundation personally doesn't have that yet, but um, definitely um, the tool can be leveraged for that instance and can be customized for the, the needs. And um, there was one more question. How will you coordinate with other organizations? Um, so if this is specifically related to uh, just forming partnerships. I think the, uh, and other organizations, which we are big on, we love collaborating. We never wanna start something from scratch or reinvent the wheel. Um, in terms of coordinating with other organizations, we um, encourage all of our partners on the ground to map resources. So resource mapping in terms of, you know, here are all of the organizations and NGOs 
um, and all of the government welfare programs that exist. And so there's this huge um, resource mapping that has been done. Um, we have a template for it. It's a simple in Microsoft Excel, um, if that's something that you would find useful. That's kind of the starting point for us is first, you know, identifying the strengths and needs of the families. Second, based on that, map all of the existing resources. And the third is um, contacting and networking. Um, so a lot of our time uh, right now is, you know, is spent um, just networking and um, identifying these um, expert organizations in family strengthening, in um, education, in um, child protection and um, forming linkages with them on the ground. Great. Um, and I know there was one big question um, and comment about the uh, directive for the 100 days and how um, I believe there's some organizations that are um, asking them to withdraw that directive and my opinion on that. So, I mean, I think it says a lot about where India has come in terms of prioritizing family over institution. So I think I see that as a great sign. I think it's incredible. I understand their motive for it. Um, of course, 100 days is not enough. Um, and so, you know, what I would recommend and what my opinion is, is um, we're stepping up and just providing these resources to make that happen safely, to make sure the children's best interests are um, what this all ends up being about and their safety. And I really appreciate your um, time and for you being here. We can continue this conversation on the Guild. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Aching to wrap up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Niyoshi, for sharing yourself, your organization, and your children with us.